This is Flippin' Junkie Podcast, episode 62. Welcome to the Flippin' Junkie Podcast. My name is Danny Johnson, former software developer turned house flipper, flipping hundreds of houses. Each week, we bring you interviews, strategies, stories, and motivation to help you get started flipping houses and on your way to becoming your own boss and achieving financial freedom. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now let's get to it. All right, today I've got Paul Lazell on the show, and I've been trying for months to get Paul <laughs> on this show, and, and he's uh, making so much money, he's added on a big addition to his house and has been GCing that and uh, was too busy to talk to me, but no, I'm just kidding, Paul. Um <laughs> But Paul, Paul's an awesome guy. I met him at a mastermind group uh, meeting. He shared an awesome strategy. And I've, I've heard of people buying houses online at auction before, but his strategy was incredible. I mean, he's just got this whole system nailed. And uh, he's been kind enough to agree to be on the show and, and talk to everybody about what he's doing. Uh, basically, just to give you a little bit of background about Paul, he, he started in real estate in 1999, became a full-time investor uh, fall of 2004. He had a background in commercial business loan underwriting and four years as a business development officer. He's a licensed realtor since 2006 and a national real estate wholesaler doing about six to 12 fix and flips per year and owner finance 10 properties per year, mostly to investors. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Good. How you doing, Danny? Uh, doing great. Glad to finally have you on here. Oh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Sorry it took so long to get on here. Oh, it's no, no problem. I was just giving you a hard time. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you want to maybe give people um, that don't know you a little bit of background of um, you know what got you interested in, in flipping houses and you know your story. Absolutely. So it, basically, this goes back to uh, my late teens, uh, middle late teens. I was working for my uncle while I was in high school. My uncle is a general contractor, and uh, he does pretty much everything. And he had bought a couple of properties that he was, one was duplex, one was a quadruplex that he was fixing up just to rent. You know, he wasn't, he didn't do fix flips. He's never done a fix a flip. Everything he buys, he keeps. So while I was working for him for during the summers, weekends, things like that, learning how to do plumbing, electrical, drywall, everything. We were ripping plaster walls down the the lathing, the uh, the metal mesh that comes with it, what a nightmare. You're just loaded with us when you do that. But that got my interest in real estate because he was buying these things pretty inexpensively, fix them up, rent them out, and had nice cash flow rentals. So that got me interested in real estate. And my end was less with the rentals, though I do have a few rentals, and more into wanting to do the fix and flips. So I started in 2002 doing the fix and flips, really kind of in the 2001, 2002 time frame. Um, did about, I'd say about three or four year for the 2002, 2003 timeframe, then really started ramping it up at the end of 2003, 2004 and had four or five going on at a time, pretty much at all times. And, uh, did that, was doing extremely well with that, went full time. I left my position with the bank in 2004, became full time investor. Um, did great up until around 2007, 2008 when everything started oh, to tank. <laughs> so, so I got it pretty good as you know a lot of people yeah. have, right? So um, I had done two wholesale deals during that time during that time period, right? So they were good deals. They were deals I could have fixed and flipped. And normally, would have wanted to do that, but I just had too many going on. So I wholesaled a couple. You know, made a quick ten thousand dollars to other investors there, and kind of decided maybe that's the the model to go to. So I have less risk, less money out in the streets at all times when you're doing these rehabs, and you got you know two hundred two hundred fifty thousand per rehab going out. It ends up, uh, you know, tying up a lot of capital. Yeah. So in 2000, end of 2008, 2009, I, I basically, I partnered with another gentleman who was doing short sales and the short sale market, you know, kind of dried up at that point as well. So we got together, we just started to go into the wholesale model. We did that and we were ripping at about 40 to 60 wholesales a year from 2009 to 2011. Um, and we were getting big, big wholesale fees in these days. And these were all bank owned too. Almost all bank owned. There, were, there were a few that we got from uh, regular owners or off the MLS that were non-bank owned, um, but for the most part, um, these were bank owned properties. You know, we had done a couple where we had forty, fifty, fifty-five thousand dollars wholesale fees on them. So these were extraordinary. Oh, wow. We were really, really liking that. I think our, the first year we did it, we had 
three over 50 wholesale fees and four nice. over 40 wholesale fees. They're great. They're yeah. terrific. So we're banging it up. Then the market started to heat up. Where, where, what market is this again? This was in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. And uh, yeah, we, did, we had done a couple of New Jersey as well. Uh, we had also done a couple. Of, we kind of branched out a little bit in Ohio, but this is when I was still more regionalized in my area. Um, then we started expanding and going into different states. We were going into Virginia. We started going down to Carolinas, Florida, um, and, and we just started doing a little bit more and more. Now, the direction I wanted to go and direction my partner wanted to go at the time were two different directions. So we decided to just uh, split up, go in those different directions, and we're still good friends. We still do occasional deals together. Um, but we just had two different models that we we're going after. And my model was buy all over the country and wholesale and occasionally do some owner financing. He wasn't big in the owner financing side. Of so that's one of the biggest reasons we had um, basically wanted to, to um, branch off and go into different directions there. So he's doing a similar model that I'm doing, but he's doing more regionalized. Like he's hitting certain places in Florida where I'm buying literally everywhere I bought and it's now I think 36 out of the 50 states so, wow. since I picked a few new properties here. I just got my first deal in Colorado, first deal in New Mexico. Um, so 36, I'm not, I have no intention of getting all 50, um, but we'll see how many I end up buying because there's states in the Northeast that you just don't really want. They're um, attorney states and there's the additional taxes when you resell, like Vermont has a land gains tax, I believe is around 15% or 12%. Oh, wow. Plus other, yeah, out of state taxes and all these things. So it really eats up your $22,000 wholesale fee becomes, you know, 12 to 15 before all said and done. So there's, there's states that I'll avoid just because of that. But that's, wow, that's how crazy. I can work. Now it's all bank owned stuff for the most part. That should hopefully catch us up pretty much to where we are now. Any other questions on that as far as how I got into the bank owned stuff? Yeah, no, no. So were you buying directly from banks or were you buying from REO it's agents? Combination. So um, directly from uh, a lot from HUD, Fannie and Freddie. Um, I try to avoid Fannie Mae as much as I can, although I just got four new deals through them here because um, they have the 90-day deed restriction mm -hmm. for senior investors, and that's a bugger. I got to do workarounds to get around those, but I try to avoid them as much as possible unless they're a great deal. Um, I buy a lot on auction companies, uh, auction websites, whether it's auction.com, Zome, Hudson & Marshall, HubZoo, uh, Williams Williams, there's a few others, Realty Bid. Um, I think Auction Network's another one now that had teamed up with another auction company. Um, that's where I get the majority of my inventory, directly from asset managers as well on occasion. I do not generally buy in bulk. I usually kind of pick and choose. In other words, a bulk tape from a, a bank. I usually don't do that. I usually kind of cherry pick what I want. Well, so, yeah, because you know why they bulk. Yes, they're giving you crap and you got yep. a couple good ones and a bunch of junk. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so what are some of the workarounds um, for the, the Fannie Mae, the 90 days? So what, what do you do to try to uh, make that not so bad? A couple different ways to do it. Uh, two new ways that I'm going to explore. The, the easiest way traditionally to do it is to buy it in, in a shell LLC, just sell the rights to that LLC to somebody else. Then you don't have to go through the whole thing. You don't even need title insurance. You're not selling it. the property. You're selling the company. Correct. So that's one way to do it. A lot of people don't want to buy your LLC. They didn't set it up. So I've run into issues where you now I've, I've got these shell LLCs and people want it in their own LLC. So we got to work around another way, whether it's off the HUD, doing it off the HUD, or doing it as a cons uh, consultation fee on the HUD. A lot of title companies don't want to do that, though. So there could be issues with that. Or another way is, and this is a new way I'm, I'm doing right now on a deal I have in New Jersey where I'm selling it to one of my other entities. And that'll get rid of the deed restriction because now there's a new deed. And then for that entity will then sell it to the end buyer. Drawback is more expense, right? Because I'm purchasing again and then reselling. I'll buy it without title insurance this time and then resell it to them. But So there are a couple workarounds that way. The other one is a trust, and I really want to look more into the trust. Now, I know HUD does not allow you to buy it in a trust. I don't know if Fannie does, though, but that's something I'm going to start to look into. And, are you talking about land trust? Correct, land trust, yeah, because I know a couple of people who in another mastermind I belong to who have done that, and that's something definitely to look into because then you're reducing your cost. Tent. You know, you're, you're just basically changing the beneficiary there. Right, right. Similar to selling a LLC. Right. Yeah. So that's a good use of a trust. I know that people a lot in the past were using land trust to hide, 
you know, basically just make it a little bit tougher to find out who owns the property. Right. You know, and they were saying, well, that doesn't provide you any real benefit other than that. And, and I guess in a case like this, it would be helpful, too, because then you're not really transferring. You know, you're not selling a property in, within 90 days and breaking that rule. Right. Right. So cool. So how did you um, what were what were your first auctions? Well, first of all, I guess, I mean, you named several auction sites. What are your favorite sites? My favorites are, and the worst, the biggest pain in the butt, but they do have a lot of properties. Obviously, <laughs> the big one, auction.com. They are pain in the butt, total pain in the butt. But um, you can get a lot of good properties from them. Uh, Zome is another one, X-O-M-E, Zome.com. They're very good. And what they do, they regionalize their auctions. So Southeast, Southwest, Northeast, Northwest, Midwest. So if you're looking in a particular part of the country, you can go to an auction that just has those properties in those areas there. Um, that's a good one. Uh, Hudson and Marshall is another good one, although their website is so antiquated, <laughs> it could be difficult on theirs. Um, Realty Bid is a decent one. They have a lot of HUD properties. HubZoo, H-U-B-Z-U, uh, is another really good one. Um, they they are a little bit. They can be tricky in some ways, but they're simple in other ways, right? So. Typically, just to give your audience an idea, your your typical traditional property purchase, you need a twenty five hundred dollar deposit, which is a pretty big one, even on a lower end property, or five percent. So if it's over, you know, one hundred thousand, you're five, you're five grand on one hundred thousand dollars. So you have a, a bigger chunk that you're putting down on your deposit. On Hubzoo, it's a little bit different. They they have smaller deposit amounts, so you can you know have a little less risk out there. They generally want to close within twenty five days, though. They can't always do that. Obviously, the title's not clear in a lot of these, and, and a lot of these bank-owned properties, just to warn a lot of your, a lot of people listening to your podcast, there are title issues, right, that need to get resolved and fixed. And uh, sometimes they can take, you know, 10, 12 days. Sometimes I've had them take seven, eight months where they basically are putting it through wow. quiet title. Yeah, they're going through doing stuff. And I've had that, and I don't mind that because that just gives me more marketing time to sell that property and potentially sell for more without having the money out there. So it can be a, a benefit for you too. Right. And so you're saying, you know, it, has, it gives you time to sell them. So what you're doing is is uh, you're, you're wholesaling them. You're selling them out as a wholesale with right. the contingency that you got clear title or something, right? Correct. Yes. Right. Okay. With the contingency. And occasionally on those deals, they haven't been able to deliver clear title, so don't buy them. Right. And then you're out of the assignment too. There's no, no problems. Right. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Do you find that people have issue with that sometimes? Yeah, you know, I had one one buyer who I sold a bunch of properties to, and, and this happened, and I felt really bad. And he was pissed off for a little while, but there's nothing I can do. It was completely out of my control, and, and we didn't know until we went through the title process. So now when I sell to him, I make sure the title's good before I even market it to him, hmm. just because I don't want you know, I want to bring him another one that goes bad. Right. But it's, that's a rarity. I mean, that's the only one I've had in the last two years where I couldn't convey it because the title was just so bad. Yeah, and we don't hardly ever have that either. Um, I think typically the only biggest problems that come up is with heirs. Heirs. You know, where there's like 15 or 16 spread across the country, three of them are deceased, and so there's even more heirs. Some are in jail. Right, yeah, there's always someone in jail, right? It's like always. 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 <laughs> you know, so yeah, so that, all that kind of stuff comes up. So it's not even just the auction properties, it's any kind of property you're going to end up having these kind of things happen too that could happen. But um, so your process is basically to buy these these uh, properties on auction and then to wholesale the properties. Um, so what is your typical, do you mind sharing your typical like deal flow of like checking online? What kind of thing do you like? And then you put your offer in and then the whole kind of process of how you're doing those deals. Sure. I'll kind of give you like a, a sample. I have a, a couple deals that just, just were, well, I won them. I don't, they're not necessarily accepted yet. Okay. But most of these probably will be just because of how long they've been on the market. So I target the properties that have been on generally 180 days or more on the market because they're extra motivated to get rid of those, right? Mm -hmm. The ones that are on 30, 60, 90, they, there's not much motivation to sell those. So you're looking for the ones that were aged. If I think anything aged over a year, well, that's definitely something I'm really going to attack because they're going to take a low number on that. Uh, this is a Fannie Mae property. This is in Millville, New Jersey. It's listed at one twelve four. Definitely a little bit overpriced. Probably should be in the in the nineties to move it. Maybe even eighties. Uh, looks like I'll be picking this one up for forty four one. 
<clears throat> that's nice. it any made though that so that one will that'll be one where I have to you know let the end buyer know how I have to convey it or I'll just buy it sell it to my other entity and just go through there. there's no transfer tax in New Jersey per se so the cost of doing that aren't going to be too bad but New Jersey does have um, an out-of-state tax where you're charged if you don't reside in New Jersey and you sell property in New Jersey you do pay a percentage it's not huge but it's something that takes you know the government gets some more money thank yeah. you John Forzine for that <laughs> well it's good to know about those things because you, yes. you end up surprised by it and have a slim profit market margin yes but, uh, it, can, it can definitely hurt you so you definitely got to know and, and I generally haven't done a lot in New Jersey over the last four or five years until this past year, I've done about 15 deals in New Jersey and there's a ton of demand in New Jersey, a lot of investors. I mean, a lot of investors in New Jersey, a lot of the New York money flows down there and a lot of the Philadelphia area where I am in the Philadelphia area goes over that direction too. So South Jersey is mostly Philadelphia investors attacking that. Mid to upper um, Jersey to North Jersey, there is a lot of New York money in there mm. and you can get some pretty good wholesale fees on that. So this is cool. That's what I like about it is you're sort of buying all over the place and, yes. and not even, you know, even further than that from where you are oh, yeah. all over the country. But okay. Had so, one in Alaska. <laughs> what's that? Had one in Alaska last oh, year. Cool. That I sold. Yeah, it was an interesting one. It was a nice little payout too. It was almost 30 grand. So it was a good one. Well worthwhile. Yeah. Where, where was that? Um, it was Roughly. way out in the middle of, well past Anchorage. Um, I'm going to blank on the name of the city it was in right now. I could probably look it up for you. Um, but it was all Eskimos in that area. It was an Eskimo wow, tank, like 3,000 residents. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you find some some Eskimo investors that wanted to? I guess you did, huh? You found it and sold it. Actually, it was it was actually an end an end buyer who bought it to to live in it, and it was one of those. It was a HUD deal. It's one of those that was vastly overpriced for jump. They started at 160. They finally dropped it down to 112. I wanted an auction at 40. They originally wow. didn't accept it until the listing agent. Redid a BPO and made a come in at forty thousand. So they would take my number. They right. contacted me back. They took it. I listed, it, sold it. I think I sold it for just under eighty on the uh, MLS. I did nothing to it, so nice. it was it was pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. So for all the people that are like, there's no deals out there because I went and looked and they're all priced at one hundred twelve, one hundred twenty. I was like, yeah, it's priced at that, but they'll take less. You know, they will over time depending on circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes you have to go into those secondary markets. Like uh, it's one in Millville, New Jersey. It's obviously not a big market. It's like a, it's probably about 25, 35 minutes to the south and uh, east of Philadelphia. So it's a, it's a suburb, an outlying market. It's a decent little area, um, but it's not a high demand area. You know, a lot of investors want to be whether it's St. Louis or Phoenix or I mean, even Philadelphia is a major market. They want to be in major markets. And sometimes you have to go to the secondary, third markets, the tier two, tier three, tier four markets to really find some good deals. Less competition, too. Hmm. It's a positive. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so have you found that in Philadelphia and some of the other cities, it's pretty tough to find a pretty good deal because just there's a lot of other people bidding up the properties? lot of other people so i go and i just got one in st louis that's that's a real good deal picked up for 12 selling it for 24 9. um that's a rarity like i've only gotten about three or four deals in st louis in the past year there's a lot of competition it just was time of the year i got it in december mm. you know and less investors out there as a matter of fact that's when i pick up most of my inventory for the year december and january i pick up a huge amount during this time of year um just it's usually when i find my best deals too the banks want to unload them get them off their books Mm. And that's one way for them to do it. And they'll take lower numbers. And that's generally uh, December, January. They'll start it in November. Kind of ends again in February. They start bumping what they want again. So a lot of these deals I win, I don't get accepted because they start to now. We're getting into the spring season where they think they can market it. Mm. So there's an ebb and flow you know, with that, just like there is when you're just mailing out to your general. Um, I got some pop up. Here we go. When you're mailing out to your general homeowner or to a, a list, you know, I used to do the the mailing to the high equity list, to the um, inheritance list, you know, to probate and all that. I did that and I did that for a while and, and had some pretty good deals. Generally, you are going to get bigger wholesale fees on those deals than you will on the bank ones. Not all the time, but you got marketing costs, too. So the way I'm doing it now, I have no marketing costs, which is great. My only marketing costs are. When I, when I um, get a cash buyer's list or mail out to a cash buyer's list, that's about it. Mm -hmm. Trying to get new new buyers in there. 
Yeah. So do you have your certain markets that you, you focus on and, and that yeah. you do build because you probably don't try to build buyers list from every market, right? I mean, correct. Yeah. I mean, I, you do, you have, we have it segmented, but you don't have, uh, since I don't do a ton of deals in St. Louis, I don't have like 50 or a hundred people on that. You know, I, I have about 10 to 15 in each of these markets where I do a smaller amount of deals per year. But the markets we focus on, our biggest markets are Pennsylvania, just because that's where I'm from, Ohio and Indiana, both the Carolinas, North and South Carolina, Florida, Texas, Arizona, um, Tennessee. Those are the markets I really kind of, that's where I get a lot of my inventory from, those markets. And now New Jersey this year. And so when you're trying to find the buyers for those areas, are you targeting, you know, specific people that have bought similar properties? Yeah. To try to add them to your buyers list because you don't want someone that's like rehabbing million dollar homes. Right. You know, yeah, because they're not going to be interested in the, the cheaper El Dumpos. Exactly. And then one way you could do I mean, there's there's a million different ways to do it. But one way I recently had done it for since I'm a licensed realtor, too, I can go on and on the MLS and pull, say, these bank owned properties, see who purchased them. Right. Or these real inexpensive properties that were rehabbed go in, find out who the uh, owner was or who the agent was, contact that agent or that owner. And those are the people you want to try to hit as your buyers because they did it once. They're selling, they're hopefully going to make some money and they'll hopefully want to repeat it and do it again. And it's a good buyer. Just sold one recently doing just that. Nice. Same complex that, that I had that? purchased one in. It was the same complex that I had purchased one in in, in Pensalka, oh. New Jersey. He had just finished his fix and flip and now I had another one for him. Same price too. Nice. Got pretty well. Yeah, that's great. Um, so what what uh, so what is the process though? I mean, you have you you pull up and you, you look for ones that have been in the market for a while in the different markets, um, and then you know how are you doing the analysis on so many properties? It's hard. So we ha- we use a VA, a couple of different VAs to do that. So in an upcoming auction, we'll say there's a southeast auction. We want to focus on Texas and and Arizona, maybe Colorado. We'll send that auction list to the VA, have the VA do some initial homework, you know, digging on a property, try to get some information. You know, they'll go through Zillow, Trulia, Redfin, all these different sites to try to pull up a value. The list, what each of of them has listed as the value there, what the listing price is, and contact information like the realtor's email, the realtor's phone number, all that contact. So then when it comes to me, and actually, I have a second layer of uh, personnel who gets that and looks at it, does a little more digging for me, contacts the agent, finds out. They try to find out what the BPO is, the broker's price opinion of the property. They usually don't like to give that, but there's another way you can ask for that same number without calling it a BPO. Just ask them what they think, in their opinion, the value of the property is, If what would you list it at for a 30-day quick sale? right? And then you're going to get an idea of what they think the value of the property is. So if it's property is listed for 80, for example, I just picked up one that was listed for 82 in Jamestown, Ohio. She recommended listing it at 59.9 to sell it quick. So that's kind of how you gauge it. Okay, all right, senior are going to be in the 50s. I'm picking that one up at 31. So I'm trying to get near 20 if I can on that, but I'll take you know 10 or 15, obviously. Too. So you feel like you have plenty of room because then you can still yeah. list it for what they suggested and sell it fast. Yeah. Yes. And even if you sell it in the 40s, you're still doing well. So that's kind of, you kind of almost going backwards, trying to figure out what the number is. And then when you go into the auction, knowing what your maximum allowable offer is, the MAO you put in there. So I can't go above this. This is the only number I can go here. And uh, if you go higher, obviously you're going to just diminish your wholesale fee. And if you aren't dying for deals, it's not smart. If you're dying for deals, you might want to do it. But if you're not dying for deals, just push them off, move them, go on to the next one. Right. So what, um, you know, so what are the requirements then? So for people that are looking for great deals, what are the requirements? Do they want to sign up for one? I'm sure they're probably different for the different sites, but, you know, basically you're going to have to pay for the property, right? So are there, yeah. you know, are people able to use hard money lenders to they pay can. for these properties? So you can. So what, the, what they'll look for, the auction company, obviously, they do want proof of funds, um, which, you know, if you're doing it, purchasing it through a hard money lender you, or you know, there's what are these other guys called transactional funders, right? They can give you a proof of funds letter. A lot of times those work. Some of them want a little bit deeper, want a little bit more information. Um, so let's say you had a friend of yours or an uncle that has a line of credit 
you can actually just have them write up letters saying that they're you're pre-approved, blah, 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 for such and such amount. You, you can do that. They aren't real picky. So they, they don't want actually a bank statement showing you have that much. Right. I use my bank statement for the most part with them. But if you don't have enough in that bank statement, then yeah. find other methods. There are other methods to do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's good to know that they'll accept those letters like that, or a lot of them will, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because even, you know, private lenders usually typically give out a thing that you're pre-approved yes. for up to two or $300,000 or whatever and send them yes. that letter and they're okay with that, huh? Absolutely. It works pretty well. So, transactional funders can even give you uh, some of these, although it does say transactional funding. And I did see somebody who had an issue with the trans transactional funding pre-approval before, but that's a rarity. Usually they just take those. Okay. And then so what's the, if you win, if you win the auction... What happens? Okay, so you get basically an email from them saying you were the high bidder at the auction. Please fill out the agreement of sale. They usually send it to you through DocuSign, um, unless it's Wells Fargo, who wants actual signed documents still. They want it in blue ink, and they want the original. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and HUD, same way. Both those want those. All the rest of them will let you do a DocuSign. Then you send that back to them along with a deposit, You know, the $2,500 deposit. That goes out to whether it's your title company or to the auction company. Each of them are different. Some auction companies want to go directly to them. Some of them want to go directly to the title company. You send that in. They accept it. Boom. Then you're set up to go to, to closing You know, within 30 days. If they decline it, then you get your deposit back. Or they may counter you. They may counter you, and then you kind of decide where to go from there. Yeah, so do they, do they, um, do they typically... Uh, you know, so let's say that something happened and, and somebody screwed up somewhere. You got it accepted and you went and looked and said, oh, man, our value was way off or something and, and this is not good. I'm not going to sign this contract. What happens? Then you can cancel that. You just don't want to make a habit of it, right? So yeah. um, you, a lot of times what I'll end up doing is writing up a, a basic letter form or getting a, a contractor to write me a quote saying this repair is this and this came out higher than I thought. So I need to cancel because this is no longer a deal to me. Um, send it back to them. I buy a lot from all these places, so they just take that. They really do. But somebody who's newer, they, they should still take that. But I know sometimes they might be difficult. Yeah. They might they might give you a little bit of a fight. My, um, I would say fight back. Fight back on them. Push back on yeah, them. Yeah, because they don't want to make it easy to do that because then it's everybody's just like shooting out stuff, not caring whether yes. they get it or not, just to lock everything up. Yeah. And if you give good rational reason, like you found, hey, there's a crack in foundation or the roof was leaking or something like that, then they'll let you get out of that. Especially when you ha if you haven't sent a contract back, you can always just cancel it. If you sent the deposit and everything back and found something pretty big, they may or may not. Auction.com is a bear. Um, a student I have, I, I don't have many students, but uh, the, one of the students I have, he had this, he ran into this issue and he decided to bite the bullet, just take the $2,500 loss on the property and move forward. Um, it was one that was going to be a little more difficult to move, might have taken up a, a lot of time and a lot of his funds for longer than he wanted. So mm -hmm. now with him, if it was me, they may they may have accepted that or I don't know. Auction.com is a bear. They're changing everything right now. They've completely reformatted everything at auction.com, and they're typically a pain in the butt to deal with. So they may even just say, tell me, hey, forget it. No, you lost your deposit now. Wow. Yeah, they're they're they think they're the biggest. I mean, they are the biggest company out there doing this, but they're acting like it too. And even your VIP rep doesn't feel like a VIP rep sometimes. Oh. <laughs> well, that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, I can imagine that they they have to tighten it up a little bit too. I mean, if they end up having too many problems with too many too many of these uh, that don't end up going through, right? So makes um, sense. Yeah. It makes yeah. So sense. how many how many would you say that you're you're doing um, per month? I know you said it depends on the time of year and all that kind of stuff, but typically eight to fifteen per month. Eight to twelve being the more norm. That kind of flow. I think I have fifteen or sixteen going this month, and probably eight to ten next month. Right now, as the deal flow goes, and it really a lot of it varies as to when. When they can close, right? Because some of these have title issues, so it's not a 30 day close, it's almost 45 day close. So instead of closing in February, now I'm closing in March. So things get pushed, pushed back a little bit. Typically, I get 
between eight and 15 deals locked up per month though. Now, how many do you feel like you're bidding on to get that, that eight to 15? Probably about 150 that I'm active, actively heavily bidding on, about 150. That's not bad. Now, it's, numbers are pretty good. Numbers are pretty good and you get, I, it didn't used to be, I used to have to throw a lot more, but then I started to get pretty good and understand certain areas and markets where I can be a little more productive than other markets. So instead of spinning my wheels, wasting time, I start targeting certain areas. Yeah, you kind of know, and yeah, I'm putting know what to target, to yeah, which properties are more likely to become deals after a while. Yes. Yep. Here's ones I look at and no, no chance on this one, Has doesn't have enough days in the market, just not worth it. So just let it go. You'll see it come on auction two or three or four more times, and then maybe it's time to start bidding on it then. Yeah. And there's some that are in bad spots that you don't want that are, say, on a main street or right on a river where they're going to need uh, flood insurance. So there's all kinds of different issues you can run into. Yeah, I guess you got to be real careful about that stuff. I didn't think about that at first, um, especially if it's, you know, there's kind of a reason, right? Why I mean, you're bidding on ones that have, have been on for a long time, and there's a reason for it. Yes. Maybe that's not always super obvious. I mean, yes, you... absolutely. There's underlying stuff. Uh, one of them, just we just closed on today in Oxford, North Carolina. This this was a property that had title issues. So it, typically in the Carolinas, there's just a lot of double wides, right? A lot of double wides on, on the properties. So that pe- a lot of people don't realize this, but the double wides are separate. They have a, a VIN number. It's a separate, it's a vehicle, right? So it's registered with Department of Motor Vehicles there. And if that has a loan, it's separate away from the property. It's actually a loan just on that, not on the land. Uh, so this one had an issue. There was no loan. This was paid off, but the person still lost a property. Um, so what we ended up having to do is kind of, it's kind of basically quiet title. We got the VIN, we, we went with the Department of Motor Vehicles, got rid of that VIN number got rid of that and just rec- and just put it to the property. So now it's officially a part of that property. So now there's no title defects, title issues with it. And we just closed on it finally today. But I had gotten that under contract in July. So it took a while. It took a while. But it's a good, it's a $17,000 payout. So I don't mind the yeah. time. Yeah, not so bad. Worth, and it was not much money in. It was only $21,500 property. So. Well, you didn't have to do any fix up, right? No fix up. Yeah. That's the so big perfect. thing. Very good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I look for those and, and, and I don't mind targeting those I spoke to the realtor found out what the title issue was spoke to an attorney had the had the realtor and attorney talk to each other a little bit to find out exactly how they can resolve it he said we can resolve it so that I move forward with the purchase this was a property that was under contract for $50,000 twice so I knew the value was there it was just a matter of getting rid of this so then we could turn around and sell it I think we ended up selling for 43 which is totally fine wow. I was hoping for 50 but 43 is great on yeah. your pet, double the money, pretty much. Yeah, I'm just reminded of, of just the power of having a mentor like yourself, or or somebody that's kind of been through these things because of these things that come up, like you said, like yeah, for a new person, if that would have happened, you know, what would they do? Deal you breaker know, to take they care would, of that. They would you know, it's like they wouldn't do it, right? You know, and so you've been there and you've you've done those things. Yeah, so that's that's really cool, and that just a reminder for everybody. It's always good to find people like Paul you know, that can help you with that kind of stuff. Cause it's, you mean, there's so many thousands of things can come up and you got to be able to work with somebody that you can call and say, Hey, what should I do? And get some sort of educated answer on, on how to go about it. Yes, it definitely helps a little yeah. hand holding. Right. Um, I was going to ask you another thing was, you know, it's being that you're wholesaling these properties. So are you doing assignments? Are you able to do assignments? Are you double closing? What, how are you handling that? So unfortunately, with a bank owned, they don't allow assignments. So everything is a double close. So you're doing back to back closing if you can. You know, sometimes I'm holding these properties for 30, 60, 90 days, sometimes longer if there's title issues, right? To uh, um, get everything resolved. Uh, so there's no back, no assignments. They're all back to back closing. So you have to come with your money, turn around, and resell. That's the drawback to this this business as compared to. When you're marketing to you know a regular homeowner where you can assign that contract which is nice because then you don't have to put anything down other than say the deposit okay so they're okay with you getting even like hard money loans yeah like it's not something where you say cash and then they get pissed because all of a sudden you're trying to get a loan on the property you know you could put on there see there's two different options you could put on there for financing or you could put on there for cash 
Um, I'll do cash because usually I'll get private money if I need to, if I need private financing and it's treated the same way because it's coming from, it's coming as cash. There's no loan documentation or anything like that with it. However, I have gotten, um, Tempo Funding is uh, a company I use that's up there in Brooklyn, New York to do some of mine and they do have a mortgage and do all that kind of stuff. They still don't care. As long as they get paid, they don't care how it is. As long as it closes on time, they're good with it. Funds, as long as funds come to them, they're okay. Yeah. It's pretty much what it comes down to. Well, cool. And so where, where do most of these um, closings take place? Do they dictate based on who who's auctioning the property or what, what's? It's actually a really good question. So they, a lot of the banks will offer title insurance to you for free. That, in other words, they'll pay title insurance if you use their closing company. I've found that this is not the best way to go. <laughs> there's a couple of reasons, right? I mean, they, they want to push it and they want to get it done quick. And then sometimes there's things they miss with that. The title insurance does cover you. However, they hit you with so many junk fees compared to what my title company charges me that it ends up being more expensive to go through mm -hmm. theirs than it does through mine. And there's another reason. Almost all of their title companies do not allow you to do back-to-back -back closings. So, and their, thirdly, the other biggest reason is they are slow about recording the deed. So say you closed on it January 5th. They may not record that deed till January 24th or even February. They're so slow with that, these companies, because they're so backlogged. They're doing so much inventory for these banks. That's why you're better off using your own title company, paying for your own title insurance. You control the time frame more. If there's issues that come up in the title, the title company pushes back. They're your bad guy. So you don't have to play the bad guy there. Um, so you do. You want somebody in your corner. So it is better using your title company. Then you can do back-to-back -back closing still. So. Yeah, you just control the deal a lot more. You know, it's not yes. just you know you're not in the dark about something trying to find out what's going on. So what and, and so they don't have any trouble with you dictating where it's going to close. No, or like what they're good with that. They're good. Well, that's with that. nice. They're, yeah, that really helps. But then you got to pay for title policy. Right, we got to pay for the title policy. Now I have a title company that will allow me to purchase it, not pay for the title insurance on my buy side and just let the end buyer pay title insurance. That's one of the title companies I use, and I like that because that saves 500, 700 bucks. Oh, yeah. for However, a couple of other title companies I use because the, the one title company is licensed in all, all 50 states, so there's states that I buy that they don't have access to. Um, some of them force me to buy title insurance, which drives me crazy because I don't want it. I'm selling directly to this right. guy. Right, it's worthless. Gonna want the title yeah. insurance. It doesn't do anything for me. Right. right? So it's, you know, it, it is what it is. That's just what they require. They don't hit me on any other costs. They don't hit me with junk fees. So it's not too bad. It's just an extra cost there. Yeah. Yeah. And those junk fees can add up to even more than the title policy. Like, like usually saying, they do. Right? Usually they do. Like a uh, service link is notorious for putting four hundred, six hundred dollar closing fees on there in the year. Title escrow insurance. fees, yeah. It is. It's crazy. Yeah, these... I've, I've seen the same thing. I've seen like $500 escrow fees per side. Yes. This is insane. I think our title company now, since we do so much business, we don't pay an escrow fee at all. We don't either, yeah. yeah. You know, so it's, and then the other side's only paying like 75 bucks. I mean, it's just like giving us deals because of the, the amount that we're doing. So that's the other benefit, right, of controlling and using your title company. Yes. As you start to get these benefits as well, so. It's huge, and I tell you what, that's that can't be understated because just because of the time it saves, right? I, I end up, you know, a lot of these people want to use their own title company. I try to pull them towards mine as much as I can, just because the other title company is now going to want all this information from about my entity. Then I have to reforward them that my title company already yeah, a lot has of work, yeah, certificate of good standing. I got to get for them, or they got to order it, and it could take a week to get from Pennsylvania. So um, it, it's there's processes, there's little things like that that you don't really think about that come into effect where if you're using your own title company, it, it may come to the point where I offer no no cost for them to use my title company, right? Or I'll pay half your cost, half the closing cost, just to get them to use mine because I don't feel like dealing with the aggravation. They already have everything. It's simple. Yeah. I might start doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good idea. Just, you know, because time is money, right? And so to, to ease the transaction, it's worth it maybe to spend a little bit more. Do it's, you have problems because you're you're investing, you're you're buying these houses auction all over the country. You're finding buyers in these different markets. A lot of times, maybe buyers that you've never worked with before. How are you 
trying to limit problems with the people that are are agreeing to buy these properties from you. Do you have many problems with that? Yeah, we get people that um, are nervous. You know, they don't want to send us a deposit. I get it, right? They found it either our ad on Craigslist or whatever. They don't know who we are. So I just tell them, fine, you send it to the title company. We don't need to have it in our hands. Send it to the title company. Or if we end up using their title company, send it to your title company. Then you don't have any issues, right? There's, so you don't make it non-refundable or do you? I make it non-refundable. Um, however, if, if somebody needs to get out, I've let people get out before. I, it's it's not I'm not it's not a real hard non refund. I just want them to commit. You know what well, that's hopefully like. Hopefully, they don't like, listen to this now because they'll just be like, "Yeah, yes, yeah, right. Yeah, we know we can just get it back." <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, we're the same. We're the same way. For, I mean, if there's a legitimate reason, right? You know, we're not going to be you know bad people. But, yeah, and I've um, had first. But yeah, you want them to commit. And, and, you know, if they're not willing to commit, then you can't be sure that they're going to close on the property. It's going to cause a big problem for you. Yes. Then we have to remarket it more time, more cost. That's another month. We have to hold the property, you know, another month's worth of homeowners insurance and yard maintenance. If we have to do that, you know, depending on the time of year where the property is located. So yeah, I'd rather not deal with that. If, if we can do it, you know, we had one where we had two buyers fall off and they were both first time investors right and it was just things they run into that made them nervous let them both go um and i'm glad we did because we were going to be selling it for 14.5 and we had to find another buyers coming in at 18.5 so it ended up coming back to be a benefit for us right (laughs) sometimes you know better get yeah and the properties that we flip in retail in in the past when we've had something happen where where the closing didn't happen and it's always like that, oh, man, especially when it's like the day of, you find out that there's some problem and they can't close and you're like, man. But, but you know, it seems like a lot of times, though, we end up with better buyers for more money or like a cash sale or something. You know, it's always like, you know, hope for that, right? So if you have that negative thing happen, it's like, well, you know what, this is happening because I'm going to get a better buyer. And it then, happens a lot. And it you're does so, happen, right? So, so right, Dan, it happens more often than not. <laughs> yeah. So. Sure. So maybe we should be trying to have our closings not happen, right? Yes. <laughs> Increase our profit margins, right? Right. right. Yeah. That's <laughs> want to <cool>. buy it? <laughs> so, so that brought up, like your discussion there brought up a, another question for me too was, um, you know, what are you doing about insurance on all the properties all over the place? Do you have a nationwide company that will insure? Yeah. REI Guard is one. Um, Affinity is another. Affinity is one I have used, but REI Guard is about half the price. Same insurance. I believe they both use Lloyd's of London. So um, REI Guard would be the one to go with right here. And, you know, because that adds up, I have a ton of properties always under contract or being held. So your insurance can end up being, you know, $1,000, $1,500 a month coming out of your account for all these different properties, even though they're $30, $20, $30, $40, $50 a month, depending on them. Some of them are vacant policies and a little bit more, maybe $100 or $110 a month. When you have enough properties going out there, that adds up. So anyway, so you can they handle it like a, a, a like a builder's risk sort of thing, where you have yes. a, a, like a rolling list of properties, you just add them and take them off. Correct. Yeah. So I get a statement each month from them. Um, you know, when I close, like for instance, I want to close today. Now I got to contact the insurance company. Say closing happened today. No longer need the insurance. Um, these are little checklist things that you need to, to remember yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many times we've. Like looked and said, how many? T- how long have we been paying for insurance on the property we sold yeah. a year ago? Right? You know, it's like, oh man. I've I've been there, yeah. done it, paying months for it, and like, ah, oh, yeah, it's a pain in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, on that list, right? Yeah, it's like the investor nightmares. You, you, you know, I've woken up before thinking about a property. It's like you know, you have these nightmares where like you forget that you bought a property and it's just been sitting there for years, and you just. You know what I mean? I was just like, yes. weird. Oh, get fears. them all the time. Yeah, get those dreams all the time. It's like it's kind of like back when you're you've done school or in college, and you have dreams. You're back in college, and you got this exam. Oh. To, you're taking an exam, and you haven't studied yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, same thing. It's same thing. But an investor, you're it's house. I got to do this. We're going to closing. We got nothing done. Yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. I have I have those nightmares routinely. <laughs> yeah, well, that's done how you know you're doing stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna check out REI Guard. We we uh, we use APIA. Mm-hmm. which their website used to, I think it's called APIA Protects is what their new website is. It used to be R-E-O-I-N-S, okay. like REO Insurance. But yep. I think now it's API Protects. And they're they're just out, out here outside of San Antonio where we are. They're okay. in Castroville, which is a small city out, or town outside of San Antonio. I'm not but sure. Been real good, so have to... but, but the Affinity, who I had used before that, was in Kansas. 
and they were pretty good and they were relatively inexpensive, but this company's half the price. So I'm mm-hmm. switching to them. I'm, I'm switching. Out. Yeah. Hopefully they're cheaper for you to save you a few bucks and your listeners. Yeah. We'll check it out and see. Well, I appreciate it, man. I got a lot of stuff out of this, Paul. I appreciate it too. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate that. It was awesome. Yeah. Great. And uh, I'll have to have you on the show again, share some, some other stuff and some stories. Uh, if Thanks, is there like a place where hit me up. Yeah, yeah. If there's a, a well, we're gonna see each other in February, right? Yeah, next month. Yep. Um, so, is there a place for anybody listening who wants to get a hold of you and ask you questions or anything? Where should they go? Sure, I'll give you a couple of different things here. I'm gonna give you my email, which is nice and simple. So, anybody wants to contact me, it's Paul, last name L I Z E L L, at yahoo.com. And if they want to take a look at the website, a lot of the properties we have, it's house dealsamerica.com and I think my email might be on air as well all right so house deals and we'll yeah. put those on the show notes page the show notes will be at flipping junkie.com slash 62 so if you want to get I'm also going to include links to all those auction sites that Paul talked about on that that along with his website on flippingjunkie.com slash 62. All right, Paul. All right. Thank you, Danny. I really appreciate it. Yeah, had a good one. Have a great day, and uh, I'm sure to talk to you soon. You got it. Talk to you soon. Have a good one. Take care.